Okay. Yes, I can hear you very clear. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, now um, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are very honored to invite Professor uh, Nico Ors from uh, University of Western Cape to give us a presentation. Professor Ors is an expert on polymic citation uh, measurements, and he is, has much experience on uh, the experiment, the data analysis, and the setups. So, um, Let's uh, welcome Professor uh, Ors to give us the presentation. And uh, I was wondering if if we have any questions, can we interrupt you in the middle? Of course, of course. That's uh, that's always uh, a good thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, are you ready to start? Yeah. Let me just set up this here. the camera here. It's okay. Can you see me? Everything is fine. Yes, everything's fine. But uh, we right. can't see your screen. I'm going to share the screen right now. Okay. All right, let me see now. Now you can see my screen, right? Uh, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, I will just be putting okay, that. Okay, let's start. 大家如果有问题的话,随时打断去问啊。谢谢。so okay thank you very much for for this opportunity so <clears throat> this is uh i realized it was a uh, i need to do this i haven't done this uh for a, for a while to gather all the lots of information that we have worked for many years i mean i, I also realized that it is impossible to give you a seminar and, and give you all the information that you may need because there's a lot of work being done in the last 10, 12 years. So thank you very much for this opportunity again. Uh, this was the some of the last pictures I took, as you know. You will know the saying in Beijing, you know, that from Mao, that you're not a good person if you don't you don't climb the Great Wall. I hope that says here. And this is a picture with uh, with from my previous visit to Beijing, with one of the police officers there in in, in the at the Great Wall. Some colleagues. Um, he was a PhD student at the time. I don't know what he's doing right now, but I don't. Know. He helped me a lot while I was there. And I will tell you about the setup that we built here at the Demo Labs, which is something quite similar to the to the one you have in Lanzhou. So I'm taking this opportunity. To remind you that there's a memorandum of understanding between, between the universities of the Western Cape and the Institute of Modern Physics, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, so which uh, is still valid, and I, I just wanted to mention that. So we have, uh, I've had, I have given different presentations yeah. in, in Bayham University in 2011, 2016. My students also gave presentations uh, at different South African. Chinese collaboration symposiums. Um, this was in 2016, where we explain, you know, our plans throughout those years. Um, but before I, I go through things, I would like to introduce myself. And the best way to introduce yourself, as you know, is through uh, showing you what you have done. So this is a, a, a link to the uh, to my Google Scholar citations, as you can see, and you know, I have an item index of 48, whatever, uh, about 1,500 citations, uh, about 150 publications. And this is uh, most of them, not most of them, but you know, one third of them. I am the leading author, as you can see, you know, just uh, a little bit of, uh, to let you know that I am, not only uh, I, I do cool excitation, but I do other things. So I many of the programs that we are we I will talk today about, or I won't talk about because there are so many, they are in our GitHub. So again, I'm clicking on the each the presentation, I will share the presentation as a link for everyone to go. And there's an Ubuntu setup, you know, these things, you know, interpolation, there's even a COVID-19 mini school. But here, there are programs that you may need, you may need to, to for yourself. Uh, in particular, there's a, a very nice one, actually, that Kenzo Abrahams developed. 
about uh, running uh, 2D uh, guy square surfaces and trying to get the minimum of uh, diagonal and transitional matrix elements. This one here in particular, which scans diagonal and transitional matrix elements in the 2D plane Thank until matching the, the experimental Thank intensity you. ratio. So these things you can find them at the UWC Nuclear uh, GitHub, developed uh, mainly by Nikita Bernier, a, a postdoc in our group. And uh, then we have uh, many programs that you can actually use there. So now we go here. Uh, I want to let you know also about the, our web page because we have lots of things, uh, as I said, being done. And um, you know, we have been, uh, we are leading experiments at CERN, at Triumph. We have commissioned new labs. We have, uh, the, you know, brought the world experts in the field to, to nuclear, uh, in nuclear physics to South Africa. Um, you know, our students are leading authors in, in, in top journals. We have brought up new arrays of detectors worth uh, two or two million dollars. Um, you know, done, done lots of things that you can see in our web, in our web page. So furthermore, you can see some of the videos with introductory uh, nuclear physics and some of the Pulex videos here in my web page. Here there's a, a little cartoon I made about isomeric states. And uh, you may welcome to, to join and and see what is what is happening late, lately in the what we do and what we have uh, achieved. So and now let's go to what you are interested in. I we built a new pipeline for Coulomb excitation measurements using particle gamma coincidences at the Temba Labs. The whole cost, you know, for for more or less roughly is about two hundred k. Is if you want to do what we with what we did. And US dollars, more or less. Because each one of these silicon, these are double double sided silicon detectors. You can see them here, although not very well. But uh, you know, I just wanted to show you the setup. These are each one is probably a, about over ten thousand dollars. You know, I don't know nowadays the price and the typical connectors, preamplifiers are also expensive, like three, four thousand euros. We bought six of them because we need different gains depending on the on the bombarding energies. We have uh, obviously fifth look cables, collimators, new chambers for these particle gamma coincidences, power supplies, you know, for different, for the preamps are these ones here, the MV and, and, and MMB and the MHV from Messitech. Everything is consistently purchased from Messitech, so there's no, there's no issues. So we, Develop new chambers. Here we have one chamber that we started with, and then this is the newest, the newest one, a little bit more compact. And this is, I have to say, a collaboration between UWC and Itemba Labs, where we have built this. Uh, uh, for instance, the chamber was built at Itemba Labs, and the digital system, the OXIA, Exia, we ran a digital system with uh, uh, essentially uh, zero uh, the time which is very, very important. So we have a, a very nice setup. We have built throughout the years and we have uh, maximized, you know, digital parameters and all these things that need to be, we work out. So if you have any questions, you can let me know here. We are all working in the lab at different experiments that we run through, uh, through the years. So this is a little bit of a setup here. We are missing the MMV. Uh, power supply to the preamps, but the rest is, is okay. So here we have the Aphrodite uh, array where we started with, with uh, long campaigns of Coulomb excitation measurements, like two months in 2016. <clears throat> and here we have the silicon detector. Very important, you can see here there's a, a plate, the beam come this way, and you have a, a collimator at the entrance of the chamber, and you have a plate, aluminum plate here, which protects the silicon detector from the being not being focused properly. Sometimes you have these resonances, these bursts, and the being may go up or down and destroy the silicon detector if you are using heavy heavy ion beams. And uh, anyway, uh, it's very. Yeah. Anyone wants to yeah. ask a question? Yes. Uh, I have a question. So you said there is a plant 
uh, in front of the uh, S3 silicon tech, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so the, the beam is like from the right, right way. Yeah, the beam comes from the right. And then, so uh, you mean when we do the experiment, uh, it's the beam, it's the plate is still there, or you just move it out when you do the experiment? So, so what is the question? So I, I mean, when when you do the column expectation, yeah, yeah. this is done. At, this is done at backward angles. As you can see, the beam comes oh. here. This is the target ladder, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So okay. at forward angles, this is very important also to understand. At forward angles, if you are using heavy ion beams, you see oh. you need to detect the particles, but the Rutherford scattering most of the times, depending on the beam, will will kill your detector in very short time and these detectors are very expensive so normally with the ions that we use we take the detector at backward angles we put the detector uh, upstream uh, and then we protect uh, the coll collimator right okay. so this here is the target ladder so we are running back scatter ions the ions get back scatter here and they go back to our detector which has both in this case these are the sectors here but on the other side we have the rings so we have 32 sectors for Doppler correction and uh, 24 rings for angular distributions, you know, to analyze the Gaussian data. But the sectors are very important because you, the more sectors you have, the better is your Doppler correction, right? So as I see, as I say, these, uh, these power supplies are also very interesting because they also provide a measure of the leakage current. You can change here from voltage to leakage current and you will see the, the the damage being done in the detector because remember these guys these silicon detectors can take say 10 to the 10 to the 9 uh, protons per square centimeter and 10 to the actually 10 to the 11 protons per square centimeter and only 10 to the 9 heavy ions although, although the damage goes proportional to z square to the number of protons square 10 to the 9 ions per square centimeter so you, it starts accumulating damage, and eventually uh, these are dispensables. You need to you need to buy new ones, right? Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, another question is: so uh, the silicon detector is two sides, right? Uh, the uh, one is yeah. the green side, and one is the uh, uh, spectral side, right? So, which one is best to the target? So, we I normally use the omic side. Normally, I use the the end 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 side here. These are the sectors. For me, you know, it's just the matter how you you how you bias your detector. It can be reverse bias, it can be, you know, depending on how you bias the detector, you have to put the omic or the p junction side on the other side, right? I, I normally prefer to have the sectors facing the beam. To have the Although you know, other people may may have a different opinion and they just have to change the 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 polarity uh, of the detector, right? Of the of the voltage. I prefer I prefer so. I prefer so because it provides me more, you know, uh, a more solid uh, understanding of what is happening. Okay. So yeah, so this is, as I say, facing the uh, omnic side or the sector side. And you can see here the different preamps, the chamber is inside the, the inside here, we have the, the digital, I mean, system, the sketch of the diagrams. We need to know, very important also in these experiments, we have two crates, one for the clover detectors, one for the silicon detectors. And these two, these two crates must be synchronized in time. You know, to do a particle gamma coincidence, most of the times you fail in not synchronizing data, right? So in this case, it's very important to control your digital system and check, you know, with a pulsar on each crate, see uh, it says the data keeps being synchronized throughout the experiment, right? It's always a checkup point that you need to invest. Leakage current, data synchronized, lots of work. This is the team. This is, you know, Kumar Radio here. Is the team that we run mostly the first uh, the first experiments at the Itemba Labs. It was uh, that campaign of one or two months together with uh, colleagues at Itemba, Elena, Kobus Lori, Matis Fideking, Rob Bark, Pete Jones is the expert on the silicon detector, the, I'm sorry, on the, on the, on the Midas. And, you know, Phil Atsley, people from the demo labs and other clicks. 
we ran the, the first experiments, which we ran for one month, I think April or May, quite solid, one month, almost two months of, of cool oxidation measurements. And uh, uh, we, yeah, yeah, you can ask, ask any questions. Uh, yeah, so I, I wonder what, how large is the, the well with the leak, leakage current, the dark current uh, have been that the silicon detector is broken? Well, uh, there's a there's a maximum of twenty uh, twenty uh, microamps here. You know, uh, twenty microamps. The detector has an alarm and start beeping. You know. Yeah. Uh, yes. I know. This is the the, the motor. The motor will, will alarm at twenty. Yeah, the motor alarm. You can you can change alarm as you wish. So the thing is, the thing is that the leakage current is a is a kind of a. Um, it's kind of a funny thing because at the beginning you may have high leakage current because of um, delta electrons. You know, if ideally you will have a nice uh, a magnet here trying to avoid the electrons to hit the detector, the silicon detector as well. So you can use magnets to do so, or as we at the end we did, we decided we ignore the the high leakage current because it was kind of fixtures leakage current. Uh, so it takes, it takes, you know, it, you need to do the study. You know, we have done the calculations for how long it will take, depending on what I say. What I say is how much, how much, uh, how many ions you can take per square centimeter of a silicon detector, right? So our idea is 10 to the 9 ions per square centimeter. Obviously, you know how many ions you have per, per second, right? Particles per second. And then that's our, our critical point, although, you know, it may vary. Depending also, as I say, with the with the ions, the heavier the ions, the more damage you produce. So this is something that you have to consider around, I would say maybe around 20 microamps, the, the peak starts. Uh, also, you have to monitor the elastic peaks. You know, if you have to see that there's a, a, a when the when the leakage current, you need to increase the voltage throughout the experiment, keep increasing the, the, the bias so the depletion voltage is rich in a way that uh, that you uh, you monitor any changes in the elastic peak and the change in the energy or any breaks of the elastic peak. The elastic peak may also create, you know, we have two bumps and then you can start seeing that the, the detector is being hit okay. too much okay. or, you know, this, these are the, the kind of things that you always have to monitor in your experiment. The elastic peaks, the leakage current, how the elastic peak, the elastic peak change throughout the, throughout the experiment, you know, there's any... You know all the all the all the linearity of the of the of the electronics have to be checked. That's why we use also Mesitech because we we know that the pre preamps are quite li very linear actually and they don't uh, change much. They have a nice gains here between 20, 100 MeV, between 100 and whatever 500 MeV. You know, depending on the on the on the beams the beams you are you are using, right? So basically, you need to monitor. Experimentally, there's no uh, a number, a magic number for the leakage current. So you need to monitor the 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 behavior of the detector because, as I say, some of the times you have uh, fixtures uh, leakage current reading. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Sir. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, obviously, when you are running experiments, you realize you know you cannot do the same thing as everyone was doing before. And uh, we need to develop new beams at the Temba Labs, and that's what we undertook uh, a few years back. Um, we decided to uh, accelerate the exotic uh, stable beams of uh, 60 nickel and 62 nickel, and then we ran 60 and 62 nickel, and Ruthenium 102 were in the books, but our, our expert, our uh, expert on the ion sources, Rainer Tomai, he said that we could only run 0 0.05 particle nanoamps for nickel 62 with using the uh, the natural nickel thing of the shelf, right? So obviously we needed to develop, we needed to develop a technique which was already obviously uh, ex existed otherwise uh, uh, where we needed to enrich the nickel 62 mm -hmm. and make it uh, a compound, a nickel -zinc compound, which is basically a sandwich molecule and we use the organometallic chemistry using the MIVOC method, again, to accelerate uh, beams to accelerate beams that were not uh, studied before to cool on excitation so this in this case uh, is a beautiful uh, enterprise we join forces again with the thermal labs 
And we have a student in Tombi Keshwa who did the PhD on this work, Raina Tomai, Lori Conradi, Salam Titinchi, Hana uh, Abo from the chemistry department, and myself. And there are many sandwich molecules that they can also run with these kind of techniques because you just inject this nickelocene product or any ocene product into the ion source and you just accelerate with the cyclotron. So we can do ruthenium, cadmium, palladium, platinum, magnesium, many things. So there was a new chemistry lab that has to be built in order for Entombi to develop the, the products um, together with uh, the collaboration. So there were many tests, you know, using the XRD, the NMR, and other characterization methods to get the right, the right uh, material, which is uh, shown here in this uh, in these figures. So finally, um, obviously, this was the plan to broaden the science case at the Temba Labs, and uh, in this case was the the main the proof of principle was nickel sixty and nickel sixty two where we purchased the enriched powder in a uh, metallic form. And then uh, with the, through the uh, work of these uh, colleagues, we, the, we suddenly have the information here. I don't know if you can see that very well, but here the nickel 60, uh, nickel 60, nickel 60, nickel 60 produce from the ion source. And it was a, a very special day because it took us many years. Ah, and Tombi graduated from her, her PhD. So this was finally uh, in another uh, Coulomb. It was confirmed. Sorry for these slides. I, don't know, I thought they were blank. The confirmation of nickel 60 and 62 beams were actually done by Brendan Lesh and Andile Sulu in the master's uh, thesis of studying the Coulomb excitation of these beams with heavy targets. We always use heavy targets. Uh, I mentioned it later using the new soccer ball frame, which was part of the GAMCA project, to investigate the paradigms of uh, the paradigm of surface vibrations. So surface vibrations are under question, and nickel 62 in particular, it looked very much like a pure, uh, a good vibrator, you know, with a zero, two plus, one phonon, and two phonon excitations. And you can see here our new uh, chamber of this array was more compact than the other one. And finally, uh, our students confirm what the what Entombi produced, the, the high quality nickel 62 beams, which were used for the first time to determine matrix elements. You know, through not the first time, it was done uh, one time before, accelerated one time before in Germany. It was through a Coulomb excitation, but to measure lifetimes, and this case was a, a Coulomb excitation to determine matrix elements. It's very important to understand that. Obviously, for lifetimes, it's good to, to develop these beams because you can do inverse kinematics and you have a, a much larger V over C. So you can measure uh, shorter lifetimes. And also for Coulomb excitation, it's very important to have a beam uh, mm -hmm. onto a heavy target because that also enhances second order effects in, in Coulomb excitation. So, we can do so much more. Uh, now with the, with the possibilities that we have at the Temba Labs, we reshuffle a little bit the, the people around. And we have, uh, we have um, the possibilities to, to study chiral symmetry in the ruthenium isotopes, which uh, we proposed a few years back. Or other possibilities, as you can see here, this is a beautiful uh, periodic table that was developed by Anton B, where you can see all the possibilities about uh, possible organometallic materials with the with the MIVOC method with these sandwich molecules that we can use at it envelops. So obviously we have expanded the possibility. We have all the expertise uh, on site. Uh, basically, this is a um, something that you probably know because this was an experiment that I was following from here. This was uh, the first school of excitation experiment with. Uh, in, uh, in China, I think, uh, it was at Lanzhou. It was used with twenty uh, with twenty eight silicon beams, uh, and then it was drawn in May twenty twenty one. A similar setup, as you can see, with a compact uh, vacuum chamber. We have the silicon detectors here, that S three, as you see, uh, and you have the collimators. You know, this was a very similar setup. I was for, uh, you know following this setup 
uh, from 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 you know the beginning, and then you have here uh, Kumar Raju show me these pictures. This was the previous with a Doppler correction, much a Doppler correction. Here you have you can see the silicon twenty eight gamma peak. The data seems to be synchronized because you have here the difference, the time difference between particle and gammas, and this is a typical uh, typical elastic peak where you can see the elastic peak here, and you have here the this low energy, uh, which is not, uh, you know, it's pile up, most of it. But basically you have most of the information here. So you have, a, you need to make a gate or attack here on the particle of interest. This is the, the silicon 28. And then you get, you get the, the, the coincidence gamma rays with the particle. And obviously you need to do a proper double correction. I think he presented some of the work just before he, the experiment uh, in, at, your, at your university. I think he misspelled here at your university, but I think he, Umar Rayo gave a seminar already, uh, I think, at your institution. So we need to develop the, also the, the theory, the simulations of what we are doing. And then also we did the Brazilian simulations of Rutherford scatter particles on S2 and S3 detectors. And this was the MSC uh, work by uh, Nicolas Erasmus. Uh, we, are, uh, we almost have a, 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 a paper in a manuscript, which is uh, about to be submitted. So where we do this kind of simulation of elastic peaks, because uh, they provide, obviously, a cleaner particle tagging, high energy calibration points that normally we don't have, with the, because we are having a, a preamp, which has the maybe 100 or 500 to 500 MeV. So the alpha particles are far off that uh, energy range. Oh, so we need a, a kind of a high energy calibration point. We use another another uh, kind of preamps with a different gain. We can have the alphas and the high energy points. At least we have a couple of points. But important for us to simulate these are the elastic peaks in our mm -hmm. detector system, right? So we can also check the target thickness, the pin energy, linearity of the electronic modules, like the as I mentioned, the MPR32 from Mesitech, the preamp. The preamplifiers. So oh, also we need to develop. Uh, any questions? Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, here. I, I wonder. Uh, in this simulation, is there any gamma rays here? So, yeah. No. These are only elastic peaks. Okay, electric peaks. And uh, so you just want wonder where uh, the the energy of the the peaks in different range. Right. Uh, yeah. That's right. I want to know. We want to know exactly the GN simulations are also very important to understand the the, the energy losses, <coughs> right? The energy losses okay. in our detector. So also the GN simulation, the GN simulations, ideally, you know, we need to, to have a Monte Carlo simulation, all the particles going through the target and see, you know, a, a beta distribution, a V over a V over C distribution, or how the particles travel through the target for a best best Doppler correction. Normally, normally you don't have that information and you run the, the V over C, your beta for the Doppler correction, you run it at center of target, yes. in, the, in the middle of the target. But uh, ideally, you know, I would like to have the best possible option, which is to do a GN simulation of the beam going through the target, right? Oh, okay. So we need to, uh, is that clear? It's okay. Can you go, can you move on? So then uh, obviously the final goal is to Doppler correct things. And here you have a typical case uh, here down here of non-Doppler correction, this uh, kind of bluish peak, uh, how beautiful it goes, you know, how beautiful uh, it gets corrected after doing a proper Doppler correction. Here you can see it better. This is the non-Doppler corrected and this is all the take, what it takes. You need to, to, to dunk, run calibrations. You need to have a, the gamma particle coincidence. The data must be synchronized. You have different particle gamma conditions. And eventually, you need to do the double correction to the data, get the prompt data, and a prompt spectra, background spectra, gamma ray spectra, and coincidences with the particles. Do your the background subtraction, and you get this beautiful final uh, physics that you can extract from these peaks. And this is what we are aiming at and getting all these uh, cool excitations uh, measurements finalized and, and published. That's the final goal. 
So this is an example of a different uh, of particular uh, sorting condition, the energy sharing plus inelastic plus time gates that are very important. As you can see here, the energy sharing in particular makes a, a nice, you know, if you have this is without no energy sharing. So the silicon detector, what is the energy sharing? Is that basically the silicon detector has dead layers, right? You don't have, uh, you know, active layers, you have rings, and then you have a little of dead layer, 0 0.1 millimeters, then you have another ring, and so on and so forth. So all these uh, dead layers are the connections, with, you know, of the rings. We put all these 24 rings together and the 32 sectors together. So obviously there are some uh, energy distributed throughout these dead layers. And you can see how the elastic peak change if you set up these kind of conditions between the energy of the ring minus the energy of the sector being less than 350 kV. You can see how the peak suddenly takes uh, a different shape and you can actually distinguish the inelastic peak here in carbon 12 much clearly because before it was hidden by the background, right? So these are the kind of things that you can play around with the sorting and they are important for, for us to understand. Again, this takes years of, uh, you know this thing now, but it just takes with developing the sorting code to a master thesis and we always keep improving, improving the sorting code with uh, better Doppler corrections. So now uh, we develop new beams, but then we realize that we have a, a very old uh, uh, array. Uh, it was uh, many years old, and then we had to get a new array. So there was an enterprise that was given to me as a PI. I was, I was voted by the Itema Labs users to undertake this huge project. And that's what we did. You know, it says uh, the this was a design of what the, we call the dandelion frame, which is uh, this was the Gamka spectrometer, which means gamma ray spectrometer for knowledge in uh, in Africa, and it was uh, a massive project that we started in 2012, October 2012, and we needed. Uh, that's a nice video. I always hit the. I, lo I love this video. Very African. Uh, very nice illustration. I don't know if you can hear this. You can see uh, lots of fun doing physics uh, in South Africa. This was a video done by uh, Sean uh, Henricks, our engineer, design engineer, who has spent thousands of hours on this design. So the Gamka the Lion is not uh, is not fiction anymore. The NRF awarded uh, UWC 35 million grand which eventually became a little bit more with the, with the, all, the, all the exchange rates and everything through the Strategic Research Equipment Program. It was the single largest grant ever given by the National Research Foundation in, in a competitive call to address, as I said before, the aging of detection equipment, or what was called Aphrodite before, to become competitive worldwide to perform cutting edge nuclear research and enhance human capital development in South Africa. So it was led by me as the principal investigator, but consisted of four South African universities 
of course, UWC, Stellenbosch University, WITS, University of Zululand, as well as Itemba Labs as the final host of the GAMCA array. So this uh, project consists of 30 lanthanum bromide plus color detector new any combinations uh, with up to uh, 18 to suppress clover detectors at seven different angles for angular correlations, for lifetime measurements. You know, it's, uh, the, the frame is very competitive and allows also eight smaller detectors, can be labs for low energy gamma rays, can be lanthanum bromide to measure uh, life, picosecond lifetimes. Uh, has been constructed and is installed and is ready for experiments. It was commissioned in 2011, in May 2011, actually when when Kumar Raju was running the uh, the first Coulomb excitation in China, we were commissioning the new uh, array, which is is here, and you can see the the empty frame of the lion of the Gamka array. So lots of work here. We have Elena and Cobos Lori. Sean Henriks and me working at night and trying to figure out what happened with the with the pillars here, the Aphrodite pillars, and how we can we have to rotate this frame because one one was more he, uh, heavier hemisphere than the other. You know, a lot, of, a lot of design, as you can see, being done and many hours being spent trying to to get things done. Also on the financial side, you know, these are macro projects, and I don't know if I mentioned here. Uh, yeah, it has. I look at uh, new frames, as I say, the dandelion, the soccer ball frame, the state of the art liquefier, one of the biggest liquefier we have in the in Cape Town. Mm, the new digitizers, new XCA with 500 megahertz, much faster digitizers, high, high voltage power supplies, and you know, many things came with the with the Gamka project to make our facility a modern facility, which is now available for everyone to 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 be used. So we also needed to develop our own skills at, at the at the what we call the more disadvantaged institutions like UWC, University of Zululand. We have to build new laboratories, and we have an exchange program with the University of York. It was a project based uh, funded by mainly by the Global Challenge Research Funds, the the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK, in collaboration with the University of York. And we got some help for the digital system, original XCA system from JJ Van Seel at Stellenbosch University. Professor David Jenkins was a monumental, he was the PI in the UK side. And here we have Cipiso in Changasi and myself developing the, uh, the laboratories. This became the flagship of in the UK for this, for this uh, global funding pro program because things actually happen and we develop new, new laboratories at the University of the Western Cape. It was commissioned, as I say. Actually, this was commissioned a couple of years back. Oh, actually, last year. Last year was commissioned the Modern African Nuclear Detector Laboratory and also <clears throat> the, uh, the, same, the same laboratory at the University of Zululand. We have an exchange program where our students go for intense training <clears throat> to the University of York. And among those, uh, projects that we have, we are developing at Mandela is to enhance our our digital experience. You know, our enhance our digital parameters to to get our best parameters when we go to an experiment, wherever we go, we know how to uh, to have. Uh, we know how to deal with Exia Exia modules. You know, they are now running at everywhere almost. You know, at, at the Solde. At the decay station, they also run Exia at the Temba Labs. So we have a much faster uh, digitizer from CAM to do something else, to do plastic scintillators. But uh, we have built a ionization chamber for Coulomb excitation for beam purity and beam energy losses. So it's important that we know that the beam is pure for this kind of experiments because we need to, to, to know what is exciting the nucleus, basically. And we need to know what is the beam, beam energy losses in the target. Eventually, you know, it's the best thing is to measure them experimentally. So we also have GIANT on the cloud, you know, GIANT simulations being developed as uh, throughout the years. And uh, here we have a picture of our student working at the, in the, one of the digital systems that we have. Here is a picture of our students at York working there. And this is the new facility, which was uh, refurbished from scratch 
uh, is now a, a, a beautiful uh, new laboratory where our students enjoy work. So now I, uh, again, uh, I have very short time to explain everything, to explain many years of work. So this is a situation uh, of, this is a typical experiment that we are running here, the orientation effect, which basically depending on the shape of the, of the nucleus, if it's prolate or oblate, the magnetic substates, they excite differently. So, and depending on this, obviously for a oblate, you have the, this, these levels are in reverse. So the zero is lower and that's more, is, is, is more populated. You know, the zero is the two plus is more excited. As you can see, uh, uh, this is a negative uh, value will be for a prolate shape. And you have, a, this is the sigma cross section for rather forest scattering. The first order is always the B2 value. The second order is the quadruple moment and also the other, other second order effects which may happen as the, as the, um, the electric dipole polarizability. So this change in the deformation, the quadruple deformation, change you know, the population of the state. In this particular case, if the diagonal, diagonal matrix element is greater than zero, that goes for an oblate shape. You have an oblate shape, you have the red curve. We have more population than if you have a prolate shape, which is the green curve. Green curve. This uh, black line here, dotted line, is the uh, for a spherical uh, shape. Or oh, for, not for a spherical, but for a diagonal matrix element of zero. <laughs> so, the change in the cool in the cool oxidation cross section as a function of theta, they characterize the deformation, which is we are interested to measure. Also, the B2 value, but in, in, in the first place, we wanted to get uh, this program going. So this is uh, these are references here that you can also use for you. And as I mentioned before, these experiments, you know, the projectile excitation is proportional to this, and then you have. The set of the projectile is here and the set of the target is here. You divide these two guys, you have the set of the target over the set of the projectile. So the reorientation effect, the sensitivity in, improves as a function of projectile of set T over set P, right? So the set of the target has to be large, has to be heavy, heavy targets. And if you run experiments like Neon 20 on on platinum 194 or lead 208, depending on how much you know the normalization of your of your experiment, then you can use always a heavy a heavy target. Normally we use 194 and 196 platinum because the matrix elements are very well known, and we can actually uh, have a, a proper normalization. Also, you can see forward angles here. Forward angles are not sensitive to second order effects like the like the quadruple moment. Whereas backward angles are more sensitive uh, to second order effects. So to keep developing the Coulomb excitation theory, we have uh, different uh, programs. You know, we send students to to different Coulomb excitation workshops. We bring the world experts here. Uh, here is Magda Zielinska. We also have collaborators like Leon Gaffney. The theory uh, John Wood comes. Also Paul Garrett is teaching here about the. Our rotational invariance, you know, model independent measures of traxiality and quadruple moments, which are very important. Here we have David Jenkins giving another presentation, and Steve Yates uh, giving a presentation on nuclear lifetimes. In terms of Coulomb excitation, there's a, a, a book, a monograph here by Alder and Winter, 1975, that you need to, to go through uh, in detail. So there's a lot of theory that I should go, but uh, this is basically, uh, I cannot go in such a short time, obviously. So this is a nice uh, a nice thing of, uh, this is the taste of nuclear physics where we again bring all these, uh, the world experts to South Africa. This was done at the University of Sutherland, this one here in the middle, here at the bottom. And, uh, and this was online because of the pandemic, but we have, in this case, we have over 600 people being registered, not all of them were at the same time during the, and there are many windows of this. But you know, here we have 200 people face to face, 2019, it was a spectacular conference, like all of them. We never thought it was going to, this year we have another one, which is not in this picture. Any questions?
Sorry, just interrupt me if you if you need anything. So we also developed new uh, new understanding of the electric uh, type of polarizability. Here is another second order effect which we need to consider because they they were supposed to be important. They are important for uh, light nuclei, which we were studying at the moment, or we were studying before or now all the time. So high impact in the spectroscopic quadruple moment measurements of light nuclei, and this is basically the alpha, uh, the alpha coming from the stark effect. This is the second order non uh, uh, non degenerate uh, perturbation theory, which le leads to this equation here of all the another second order effect, which is ground state going to the GDR region and intermediate states, and going finally to the state of interest where you want to measure the shape, the deformation, right? This is the first two plus in neon 20, silicon 28. And this virtual excitation by the, GD, by the giant dipole resonance may affect B2 and quadrupole moments. As you can see, it's another second order effect, like the reorientation. The orientation here is also a second order effect because it goes first order is the B2 value. Second order is the reorientation of the magnetic substates. Here we have all virtual excitations, you know, to the giant dipole resonance and going back to the. So as you can see here, this affects the the the, the deformation or the or the collective motion because there's a torque produced by the interaction between the electric and the dipole uh, moment that may set the nucleus into rotation and enhancing uh, the quadrupole collectivity, right? So this is a typical picture which you can see in appendix J. Of other with <laughs> questions. So this effect is important, as you can see here. There's a shift of plus zero point five mm -hmm. uh, in this part. In one of the cases, I think this is uh, for beryllium ten. If we uh, if we have uh, you know this is the prolate side and this is the oplate side, and the uh, Obviously, the positive means uh, negative uh, intrinsic quadrupole moment, and the negative means positive intrinsic quadrupole moment. So the polarizability shifts the static quadrupole moments towards the prolate shapes. And this is very important, as I say, to have a full understanding of this. And then we have developed new polarization potentials and new formulas, and we have new equations for how the nuclear polarizability, in this case, the sigma minus two, which is related to this, to the electric type of polarizability. I don't define it anywhere here. Uh, it's here, it's defined here. And it's basically the total for the absorption cross-section, integration of the total for the absorption cross-section divided by the E energy of the gamma square, right? We integrate that, and it's very sensitive because of the denominator to low energy uh, structures in the GDR. So this is the different potential which comes. This is the um, effective quadrupole potential, which comes from the quadrupole, quadrupole potential modified by this uh, polarizability potential, which is given by this in fun, in, as a term, in, as a function of orbital integrals, where this factor here is changed by our new uh, fit to the data. And the new, we, in such a way, we could explain the enhancement of this polarizability and low uh, for, help, for light nuclei. And we developed different parameters in the literature to determine the symmetry energy as well. So, which is related also to, you know, there's a lot of uh, play you can do in this with this, uh, with this nuclear polarizability to study uh, because it's related to the, to the equation of state in neutron stars, right? So we keep working, and then we, besides our experiments at the Itemba Labs, we also run experiments at uh, ISOLDE, Triumph, and this was the first African-led experiment proposed at uh, CERN. <laughs> there was a lot of media. And you, again, you can see here, Umar Rayu, uh, there was a, this is done with a mini ball. And then we have 12 members of our, our team going to, actually, these are all the 12 members of our team. Mainly, uh, you can see many uh, black students going to CERN for the first time. Also, we run experiments at the at Triumph. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 
I cannot hear. Anyone wants to ask a question? Okay, I'll continue oh, then. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, uh, I don't know what is happening with this uh, picture here. Uh, well, it was a, a nice picture of the tigress array here, but has been, it's not, it's not there anymore. So again, this is the Bambino, the Bambino chamber, again, a similar chamber to the ones you have there. Here we have, a, again, the beam come this way, a shield in the, of, uh, you know, protecting the silicon detector. And then in this case, we are running radioactive ion beams, carbon 12, no, it's not a radioactive ion beam, but we run beryllium 10. So the, we can also use a power uh, silicon detector without being damaged too much. Also, the, the currents that we run up at radioactive ion beams are not so high. And from this experiment, we, we, uh, we study the effects of three nuclear forces, in particular in beryllium 10, where you can see with two nuclear forces here with the AV18, a nuclear nuclear potential, you have a two plus state here, which change we change and becomes the second two plus state if you include three nuclear forces. And uh, the same thing happened with this guy. If you include three nuclear forces on top of the two nuclear forces, the second two plus becomes the first two plus. This was the experiment, but the key here was to test if this, uh, no, if this uh, in this case, uh, green function Monte Carlo calculations of the region 10, they were right because the first two plus, there was an inversion of the first two plus uh, two pluses, and we did a, a, a cooling station measurement and determined that indeed it was a, a prolate shape, what was also uh, determined for the first excitation. So the first excitation was prolate here, and the second uh, was oplate. So this inversion of levels came also with a change in the formation, and we confirmed that it was the case. But not only that, we also confirm, obviously, what, what most people know that the, the spin orbit interaction is not well known. And they have a different, the, a different uh, spin orbit interactions for the two nuclear, uh, the three nuclear potentials. The three nuclear potentials add more binding to the, to the, to the spin orbit interaction. And we know that because we run the CD bond two nuclear potential, we could also reproduce what was claimed to be only reproduced, including three nuclear forces. So this was published as a rapid communication. Um, I was only, uh, it was not a PRL because of the statistics that we have in the, in the uh, experiment. So we also ran carbon 12 at Triumph, as you can see, Kumar Rayu led this, uh, this work. And it was published as physical, uh, physics letters B. And this was the first coolant excitation work led by our students and postdocs and published in Physics Letters B, as I say. And here we have the most likely uh, oblate shape of carbon 12, which was uh, determined as 0 0.053 plus minus 0 uh, 44 EB in agreement with no coercion model calculations. Here is the link. The Klebs Gordon coefficient here, the link between the spectroscopic quadrupole moment, which is the shape in the laboratory frame, not to be confused with the, the intrinsic quadrupole moment, which is the real shape of the nucleus and is proportional to the diagonal matrix element of the electric quadrupole tensor. So, more experiments, you know, this was the proof of principle uh, experiment that we ran in those, uh, those two months of uh, 2016. It was published last year as a letter in Physical Review C. First time, you know, Argon 36 was uh, excited, uh, um, populated at safe energies and uh, doing a gap, particle gamma coincidence, you can see it was very beautiful the way uh, it was the first time that this was run at safe energies, you know, before there was also discrepancy. Because, you know, that's also a very important point that I wanted to make here that your energies cannot be as we well below the Coulomb barrier, and for this particular nuclei, a key, uh, a nominal uh, 6.5 Fermi between between the two surfaces, between two nu the nuclear surfaces, must be 
must be looked up when you design your experiment. The beam bombarding energy must be such that the separation between two nuclear surfaces must be 6.5 Fermi, not 5 Fermi, as is norm normally the case for heavy ions. This was done in a review paper by, by Ray Spear in 1981. Uh, it was clear that previous measurements of, uh, of quadrupole moments were, were not done at these safe energies. So you have, cool, you have nuclear interactions, uh, nuclear contributions, which may change the, the, the formation that you are measuring. So the nuclear... Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, so when you said heavy ions, what kind of, uh, so carbon 12 is heavy, it's not heavy, right? So for instance, we run, when we run the nickel 60, uh, I think those are heavy, you know, it depends, I think, depends obviously on the, on the Coulomb barrier of the two of them, right? So Coulomb barrier from nickel 60, the, the photoneutron cross sections are dominant from nickel, actually from nickel 62. The photonuclear okay. photoneutron reactions are dominant, so that also implies that that the, the gamma p or, or the proton uh, is not so easy to to the Coulomb the Coulomb bar is quite uh, high, so it's difficult for the two guys to merge, right? To have yeah. uh, to get close to each other. So I would say that from nickel sixty something. Okay. The case of nickel sixty and nickel sixty two is a very special one, but above those two guys. I would say we are fairly uh, safe to have, uh, you know, we run the nickel, uh, the nickel experiments with five Fermi separation, okay. which is the uh, client's prescri prescription for, for doing Coulomb excitation measurements with heavy ions, right? Okay, thank you. But that again has to be measured. The best way is to measure it. These are prescriptions because normally we have no time to, to see, but obviously you need to see, to, to measure deviations from the rather four, from the Rutherford scattering. As soon as, as soon as you have deviations from Rutherford scattering, you know that there's some nuclear contributions playing a role, right? So ideally, in any in any experiment, you should be able to run a few energies and see, okay, this energy, this energy. So once you hit energy, which is uh, you know is 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 kind of uh, diverging from the from the smooth trend provided by the Rutherford scattering, then you know that you went too high. Again, you want to go as high as you can, but not be not too high because once you in, in, include the nuclear the nuclear contributions, you you don't really know what you are doing. You cannot measure quadruple moments, for instance. So, it. yeah. Yeah, any questions? Okay. So then, uh, as you can see here, this was the, the previous NNDC work. It was a very large uncertainty. This is our new measurement here, which agrees with the shell model calculations that we also perform for, for this nuclei. There was a kind of zigzag shape here that we are trying to investigate. Uh, we have measurements here. Uh, you have the measurement there for silicon 28. We also run sulfur 32, agreeing with this data point here from the NNDC. So this six up, six up of the formations in the uh, along the SD shell, we wanted to investigate, and we have done uh, most of the nuclei. Also, we have argon forty, which also agrees with this. These are unpublished results. These two guys, and uh, these are unpublished because uh, you know, we need to 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 finish things. Uh, it's not so easy here. Uh, it's always uh, we have done a lot, but there's always things to do. So I want I want to go to my to the conclusions because uh, uh, I think we are getting a little bit uh, over time. So we have built a, a state of the art pipeline for cooler excitation measurements using particle gamma coincidences. We have developed new sorting codes, uh, plus Zian simulations. You know, obviously these particle gamma coincidences come with lots of uh, lots of uh, design and development development with digital systems. We gain expertise also in Coulomb excitation theory, plus data analysis with uh, this kind of uh, data to, to do the Doppler corrections. And with Gosha, we also developed all the Gosha recently. I didn't show that, but we have a minimization, data minimization, or where we consider all data 
uh, particle gated, uh, target gated, and we have a minimization, which takes many days, like three, four weeks to, to run it properly. So you need very high performing computers. And uh, the more data points, obviously, the more, the more, the more time it takes. And sometimes it's very difficult here to do in South Africa with the load shedding because we have to, we have to accommodate for that. We, so we bought our inverters to run uh, this kind of uh, calculations or simulations for a long time. We developed new beams with the MIVOC method, as I mentioned before. There's a brand, brand new possibilities at the Temba Labs. We build new arrays of gamma, uh, gamma ray detectors, the GAMCA array, the LION, as I mentioned. We written grants worth over 50 million, grants about $3 million, over 1,000 financial operations. We know we didn't, never mentioned those, but they are also very tedious. The same modern nuclear physics, no, modern nuclear physics laboratories, Mandela's at uh, UWC and Itemba Labs, publish our, our results in top journals, including the proof of principle experiments for our cooling excitation pipeline here at the Temba Labs. We presented international international conferences. We also send our students everywhere. Our exchange program is, is beautiful and there's nothing to, 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 to worry about that because it's just something which I'm very proud of, how our students go and, and get exposed with other, other people. Maybe we should go to China sometimes. And 20 students graduated from this program. All of them working on machine learning now. All of them got jobs, big data, academia, uh, nuclear industry, they're teaching. And as I always say, we are about to just wait the best deal to come because there's still many publications coming right now, including some nuclear astrophysics that we developed through this program. Uh, not easy. It's always, uh, we're always struggling to get things done, but uh, because this is a huge enterprise. I want to acknowledge everyone, I don't, not in alphabetical order, in any order that I came to my mind, people from all over the place, because as I said at the end, these many achievements are we, are not I. Uh, many people contributed to make this, uh, this beautiful job done because it's a massive enterprise. As you can see, we have done so many things that is, is not even uh, imaginable. It's not uh, it's like, very, very complicated. So as uh, as we say in our lab, at the entrance, it always seems impossible until it is done. So with that, I want to uh, stop here and then I open for questions. Thank you very much for having me uh, with you. Any questions? Oh, hello, uh, professors. Can you hear me? I have yeah, one I, question. I, uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And uh, uh, I want one simple question is about your uh, cross section, the the of that you know prolate and oblate uh, shapes. Uh, so yeah. I wonder uh, if the nucleus is tracheal deformed. So what's the cross section for that? Yes, here. So if the nucleus is tracheal form, uh, you also oh, soft, the, gamma soft, something like gamma that. Soft, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so if it's gamma soft, if it's gamma soft, you don't really know if if it's uh, if it's prolate or oblate. So yeah, it's exactly. complicated. So for that particular case, you need to you need to run you need to run the the Kumar climb sun rules or the um, rotational rotational invariance, right? So for that particular case, you need to have a, a huge set of matrix elements, and you can do it for mm -hmm. the zero plus. You need the matrix elements for the the P2 value, the reorientation effect. Then you need the second two plus also, the matrix element to the second two plus, the reorientation effect in the second two plus, and the sum rule goes like, like this, going back to the ground state. So we need all the matrix elements for the zero plus is the easiest case scenario. For the two plus, you will need matrix elements from four plus, from all the, all the interconnecting uh, levels, right? So the sum rules become more complicated. So mm -hmm. you need... You need bountiful. Uh, this is the actually the best way to do this this job. I didn't mention that because we have no time, but we also have uh, we also have a, a a program to measure you know to do rotational invariance and 
Mm -hmm. For instance, for Rufi Rufini 102, mm -hmm. Rufini 102, uh, the proposal, uh, you know, includes to do rotational invariance of the, uh, the Kumar cl climb some rules mm -hmm. to determine the intrinsic properties of the nucleus, including triaxiality and the intrinsic quadruple moment, right? Mm -hmm. so this is the experiments that we have only done a handful of them, only five, mm -hmm. but you have, as you know, Professor Monk published, I don't know, many hundreds of publications and, you know, Stefan Frauendorf, many people published lots of publications on this, but they need to be tested, right? All this, uh, all this traxiality business is always infer, you know, uh, from, you know, the, the gamma band, from, you know, the wobbly motion or the non-wobbly yes. motion, but we need to infer those things more substantially, you know, we need to actually measure those, uh, those the traxiality, the yeah. traxial deformation through coolant excitation, through, through rotational invariance. This is the best mm -hmm. way because we have like thousands of publications. Yeah. But as I once told Professor Monk, we, we, this is a, a very important step towards uh, confirming all this uh, discussion that we have about traxiality. Otherwise, we are just blaming. Normally, we blame traxiality when, whenever we don't understand a, 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 mm. a problem, but this is not the way to do it. The way is to measure it and then confront with uh, theory. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, I wonder if, if it is a uh, uh, tractor nu deformed nuclear or tractor soft nucleus. So, what's um, mm, what does this uh, value? I mean, this. Uh, uh, how to say the the cross section looks like? Uh, it's also similar. Like it will, so. it will look it will look similar. It will look similar to this one. Uh -huh. It will look similar. So I see. It will look similar to this one. So. I, but, see. Uh, mm -hmm. I see. So, but uh, as I say, it will be more. We need more data. We need to run for a longer time because in this yeah. case, we are running an experiment maybe for for a week. To get the oh. first, the quadruple moment, because it's quite high in excitation energy, right? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So obviously, the higher you are in excitation energy, the more difficult it is to populate those through coolant excitation. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I don't know if I have I have the, the proposal somewhere, Ruffini one or two. Mm -hmm. But there, uh, you know, if you want to, to populate, we need to max up the, the bombarding mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with Ruffini beams, you need to go mm -hmm. and get the second order effect. But also you can play with this, this, you know, we can use, use a Ruthini one or two target and have a different mm -hmm. beam to get the first mm -hmm. order because you know that the, the forward angles, you mainly have mm -hmm. the B to value here, right? Uh -huh. so this gives you B to value and this gives you quadruple moment. So this, uh -huh. you have to play with the combination of uh, different experiments. So you know, I well, see. your B to values, so you can also determine the quadruple moment. But mm -hmm. I mean, this requires lots of time Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a, a very uh, demanding experiment, uh -huh. but it can be done. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Anyone else have questions? Who was uh, who was talking right now? Excuse me, Shen. Who was that? Uh, yes, Lee? that uh, is Chen. Is Chen right here? Yeah, uh, I, I was asking if anyone else has uh, has any questions. Uh, okay. Uh, could you please uh, uh, give the slides of uh, carbon chart, the experiment set up at Chang? Sorry, which which one? Uh, the experiment set up about uh, carbon yeah. chart. Oh, the set up for carbon twelve. Yeah, it was. Yeah. In the, oh, the, the, the carbon 12 was done at Triumph. Oh, so, yeah. so it's a similar yeah, setup to this one, but... Uh, uh, I, uh, I noticed that uh, in the in the trans, in the uh, carbon 12 experiment, there are uh, two silicon detectors, both in the, uh, in the forward and the backward angle. Yeah, 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 this one, this one, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I see what you're talking about here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we in this experiment we have two two uh, silicon detectors. I wonder the, what's the difference about the counting rate between these two silicon detectors. Well, uh, it's the same. The same in this case, 
You see, there should be two S3s, but we are running an S2 detectors at forward angles because it's, they are cheaper. So it's cut here, it has a little bit of a fire sim a symmetry. So, but the setup, as I mentioned, as I mentioned just before, the forward angle gives you the P2 values more uh, cleaner P2 value than the backward angles, right? Backward angles will give you more second order effects. <laughs> So in this case, it was nice because we can run this kind of experiments because we have light particles and because the beam currents were not very high, right? Yeah. If you have heavy ions, then the forward detector will be uh, heavily damaged. So you have to be very careful also. You also need to study how long the, the, the forward detector can live. I mean, you cannot just waste your money, right? So you need to, to do studies of, uh, of uh, detector uh, damage damage in the in the silicon detector how long it will take and also we have a a, a project which is you know to build you know all the kind of uh, detectors like silicon carbide detectors that they can have uh, uh, 10 times more radiation damage than normal silicon detectors but these are things that happen there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, big thinking to make this uh, to make the best cool excitation measurements uh, ever and uh, so I, I also wonder the cross section of uh, those for the center uh, scattering between the cross section of column excitation. So, so say that again. Uh, I mean the cross section between uh, loss for the of the column excitation. So that's that's uh, that, that's uh, that's overwhelming. The the, the run for scattering is overwhelming compared to the to the. Uh, I show that here a little bit, but uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I show this in this uh, uh, at the beginning here. So this is the the peak here. The inelastic peak is somewhere here, and this is the run for scattering. This is the last, the elastic peak. Yeah. So and this shoulder here, this little shoulder here comes with the carbon 12 in elastic peak a 4.4 MeV, right? So okay. there's quite a few uh, orders of magnitude between the little bump here. Oh. Uh, you know, you if you do a a, a proper uh, analysis, you can see that there's a little bump like this compared to the big elastic peak, right? And okay. this results in this shoulder here on the left side. Okay. So there's several orders of magnitude more for the elastic peak than for also depends on your on your first two plus, right? The as I said before, the higher is the first two plus, the less counts you're going to have. The this is this is all about having a, a diabetic adiabatic process or a sudden impact process. If the energy is lower, you have a higher uh, a larger torque. Then you have a high excitation energy where you the, the process, the elastic or the, the scattering process becomes of the adiabatic. So when the, the, the process becomes adiabatic, then the coolant excitation gets smaller by, you know, it's, uh, it decreases very rapidly with this adiabaticity parameter, which is basically the time of the collision over the time of the, uh, of the nuclear level that you want to study. But as I said, there's a lot of nuclear theory that I didn't go through because I wanted to focus more on the on the bigger picture that we are. Uh, so there's no time. Uh, and I have uh, another question about that. Uh, so uh, I can see that. Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, is there any difference between we we measure the E two matrix elements between or the E3 matrix elements in the uh, column excitation? Well, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, E2, E3, E1, it's all a Taylor expansion in the in the uh, electro electromagnetic uh, field. In this case, in the electric field, you have, you have uh, the E0, which are electrons, you have the E1, which is dipole, you have the E2, which is quadrupole, E3, so the, the the more terms you go, the the less uh, is the probability to excite the uh, the nucleus. Okay, thank you. But still, it can be done as as you can see. 
the, the key the key point here uh, we have also collaborated to uh, Peter Butler's uh, nature papers and Leon Gaffney's uh, not that one yes. but the nature the, the late late nature communication by Peter Butler my student Ken Abraham was part of the of the designing I mean the, the the working on the on the setup he worked at CERN for for a few months and he was there during this campaign. And you need to have the key. The key thing was to accelerate these heavy ions, right? To have more cross section. If you want to measure the the octopon, or you want to measure any kind of deformation, yes, yes. Then mm -hmm. you need you need to have uh, this combination I mentioned before, uh, a beam on a heavier target, if possible. Okay. Um, hello, Professor Oz. Hello. Uh, How can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, have you made your decisions coming to visit China? I have to make a, I have to make a decision. I don't know if that would be actually of any any help. I would love to. I would love to go to China. Uh, I'm very glad for the invitation. Shen, I, I, I really, I really appreciate your your effort. But I was thinking, I was thinking, if possible, it would be better if I can take a student with me. You know, to to learn oh. all these Gosha, all these Gosha things. It's good to have a student, and then uh, he can actually sit down with your students, and it will be a, a much better, a better uh, approach. If if you allow that, uh, that will be actually uh, an easier way for me to. To, to help you, if I could bring a student with me. Oh, yes, I, I have received this email and, and never get a chance to reply, reply you. Um, you are all welcome. You will, will, uh, we will pay the expenses for you and the students, of course. And it's lovely to have you visit us. I mean, uh, but uh, we, our support is expired until November, right. as I mentioned. So right. I was wondering when you, you might be a visitor. So I, I love to go in sometime in October, November. But, you know, my, my wife now is in Germany. So she's visiting okay. her parents. She's coming tomorrow. So before I, I, I communicate, I have to talk to her and tell her whether she's, uh, you know, she, she's okay with that. I mean, we need to. She also. She also a bioinformatician. He does. She does a lots of work here at the, at the university, and we need to come with these kind of conclusions. The two of us together. So to, tomorrow she's she's back from Germany, so I will let her know. But I agree, I really appreciate your 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 invitation. I'm very. Uh, I love. Uh, I've I've been to China before. I love. Uh, I love uh, China as a country and uh, all the work that you put. Hard work that you put, and, and I I'm looking forward to support any program that you already developed something in Lanzhou. So it would be nice if we can also go to Lanzhou and see how things go there. Although we can, you know, it's, it's it's up to you. So we need to plan this carefully because there's a there's a setup which is already available. Is that true? Chen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. I understand that. So please let me know if you have. Um, made any decisions or you have made your schedule, okay? Will, so we I have to prepare, uh, prepare for the invitation letters and other documents. Right. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, thank you so much for uh, for the presentation. Actually, I actually want to say oh, a happy, bir you. happy birthday to Nikita, who is here in the audience, I think. I didn't have the time <laughs> to say. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, right. Nikita, and everybody. <laughs> Hi, Nikita. Happy birthday to you. Thanks thank for you, coming. Thank you, Nico, for sharing all the work we do <laughs> and for everybody's interest. So thank you for your presentation and thank you for um, willing to visit us and it would be a really great help for us. Thank you so much, Shem. And all the, all the group, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, she and Sai <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if there's no more questions, we thank Professor Ors for this wonderful presentation. And we'll keep in touch, okay? Thank you so much. All the best. Okay, bye. Bye-bye, thanks.
Who is this right here? 